Oh, <clears throat> welcome to Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> I have been napping, so my throat is a little throaty. Uh, so we're going to drink some water. My little lid flipped up. So we're going to drink water. So we can get our throaty, <clears throat> a little unthroaty. I have been napping again, so my hair is a little flat on one side. I did, I napped it up good too. I needed it too because, um, because I didn't sleep really well last night. And so, <clears throat> and so I needed a nice good nap. So today starts a series. Hi, Helen. Dr. Helen is here. Today starts a series of readings that I'm going to do, short story readings um, leading up to Dr. Helen's. <clears throat> excuse me, next episode in November um, about Eudora Welty, who is an author that Helen did her dissertation on. She was also a photographer uh, and several other things, but Helen can tell us a lot more about Eudora Welty um, as we're leading up to her um, next episode in November. And I'm very excited about her next episode. Helen is very passionate about this author um, and in turn has made um, me rather passionate about this author. I am learning as much as I can about uh, Eudora Welty. Um, I will tell you that today I am not as prepared as I would have liked to have been because I there I, there was a lot. I was I've been very busy today, um, so I, I was not able to prepare as as well as I had wanted to prepare for um, this episode. But Helen can. Uh, I mean, there's reading, but Helen obviously is going to be able to answer all of our questions. Eudora Welty was born um, April 13th, 1909, and she passed away July 23rd of 2001. Um, so her writings are going to be, um, they're going to be in a different type of a vernacular and they're going to be using <clears throat> a language, um, and, and words that, that we don't really, um, that we don't really use now. So there are a few times she, uh, uses words that, um, I'm not going to use, uh, I am going to, um, I am going to use a different word um, just because those words are not, are not something that, that uh, we would say any longer. They're, they're not really words that you would say back then, but because she was writing a short story in the vernacular of the time and um, those types of words would be situational for her stories. Um, but y'all, if y'all, if y'all were watching when I was reading uh, the other book earlier in the pandemic, then you know that I, I kind of do different words. So anyway, another reason why we're doing this is because Helen, Dr. Helen is so generous. And I had mentioned to her that I wanted to do a contest. I wanted to do a giveaway. And she mentioned, um, Edora Welty did, has written a, a, a beautiful short I have not read this book yet but I'm going to it um has written a, a beautiful a children's book it's kind of a preteen book um called the shoe bird and it is uh we're going to be giving away these two books um we have an essay we have two essay questions Dr. Helen gave us two essay questions that I will be um I'll be putting out I'll be posting uh, today, after we're done reading, I'll be posting both of the essay questions uh, for the contest to begin. And anyone who replies to the essay question will get a chit chatting with Becca button. If you all remember, I'm going to get you one right now. See, this went up. So you'll get a button. But the two essays we will be choosing, uh, Doctor, we will read the essays. And then Dr. Helen will choose two essays. Uh, to win the contest and we'll send you this book. So that's very exciting. So I'll get these essays. Uh, I'll get these two essay uh, questions uh, written up so y'all can get your essays started. The contest is going to run until um, November the 7th, which is Dr. Janet's next episode. Um, so the contest will run until November 7th. That'll give uh, Dr. Helen and I time to uh, to go over the essays and um, and get uh, and choose two winners and then we'll announce those winners on on Dr. Helen's show. So that's very exciting. So I don't think I'm forgetting anything else, but that I might be. Anyway, so let's get started reading. Uh, this is a collection of her works. 
of Eudora Welty's works. This is a collection of her short, short stories. And you can pick this book up at your local library. I, uh, I borrow Dr. Helen's copy for, uh, for a second and then um, immediately went out because I wanted to be able to make notes and stuff in my copy. So then I immediately went out and I went to half price books and got and picked up a copy. Um, so if you have a half price books or a, or, a, or a used bookstore place, you can pick up your pick up a copy of the Eudora Welty's uh, collected stories. Otherwise, check it out from your local library and and you can start there. So I have everything um, marked off here. Now I will remind everyone that I have a learning challenge. Um, so it is very difficult for me to read on occasion. So, well. It's very difficult for me to read. So um, I am definitely stepping out of my comfort zone um, to read again. And this is, uh, while it is a short story, it is about 10 pages long. So you will need to, if you can, just bear with me while we while we uh, read this. It may take me a little over an hour to get through it because I do read a little bit slower, But but here we go. This short story is called Why I Live at the P.O and PO stands for post office. I was getting along fine with mama, papa, daddy, and uncle Rondo until my sister, Stella Rondo, just separated from her husband and came back home. Mr. Whitaker, of course I went with Mr. Wh Mr. Whitaker. Of course I went with Mr. Whitaker first when he first appeared here in China Grove, taking pose yourself photos and Stella Rondo broke us up told him I was one-sided, bigger on one side than the other, which is a deliberate, calculated falsehood. I am, the, I am the same. Stella Rondo is exactly 12 months to the day younger than I am, and for that reason, she spoiled. She always had anything in the world she wanted, and then she'd throw it away. Papa Daddy gave her this gorgeous add-a-pearl necklace when she was eight years old, and she threw it away playing baseball when she was nine with only two pearls. As soon as she got married and moved away from home, the first thing she did was separate from Mr. Whitaker. This photographer with uh, the Popeyes she had, she trusted, came home from one of those towns up in Illinois and to our complete surprise brought this child of two. Mama said she'd like to make her drop dead for a second. Here had here you had this marvelous, marvelous blonde child and never so much as wrote your mother a word about it, says Mama. I'm thoroughly ashamed of you, but of course she wasn't. Stella Rondo just calmly, and her name is Stella-Rondo, so Stella Rondo. Stella Rondo just calmly takes off this hat. I wish you could see it. She says, why, Mama, Shirley T's adopted. I can prove it. How, says Mama. But all I says was, hmm. There I was over the hot stove trying to stretch two chickens over five people and a completely unexpected child into the bargain without a moment's notice. What do you mean, hmm, says Stella Rondo. And Mama says, I heard that, sister. <clears throat> I said, I said that, oh, I didn't mean a thing. Only that whoever Shirley T was, she was the spitting image of Papa Daddy if he'd cut off his beard, which of course he never would in the world, which of course he'd never do in the world. Papa Daddy's mama's papa and sulks. Stella Rondo got furious. She said, sister, I don't need to tell you. You've got a lot of nerve and I always did have and I'll thank you to, and always did have and I'll thank you to make no further reference to my adopted child whatsoever. Very well, I said. Very well. Very well. Of course, I noticed at once she looked like Mr. Whitaker's side too. That frown. She looks like a cross between Mr. Whitaker and Papa Daddy. Well, all I can say is she isn't. She looks exactly like Shirley Temple to me, says Mama, but Shirley T just ran away from her. 
So the first thing Stella Rondo did at the table was turn Papa Daddy against me. <laughs> That's the first thing she did. She turned Papa Daddy right against her. <laughs> Papa Daddy, she says, he was trying to cut up his meat. Papa Daddy, I was taken completely by surprise. Papa Daddy is about a million years old and has got this long, long beard. Papa Daddy, sister says she fails to understand why you won't cut your beard off. So Papa Daddy lays down his knife and fork. He's real rich. Mama says he is. He says he isn't. So he says, have I heard correctly? You don't understand why I don't cut off my beard? Why, I says, Papa Daddy, I of course understand. I did not say such a thing. The idea. He says, hussy. I says, Papa Daddy, you know I wouldn't more want you to cut off your beard than a man on the moon, a man in the moon. It was the furthest thing from my mind. Stella Rondo sat there and made that up while she was eating breast of chicken. But he says, so the postmistress fails to understand why I don't cut off my beard. Which job I got you through my influence with the government? Bird's nest. Is that what you call it? Not that it isn't the next to smallest PO in the entire state of Mississippi. I said, so she's very thankful. Thank you, Papa Daddy, for getting me a job at the smallest PO you could possibly get me. I says, oh, Papa Daddy, I says, I didn't say any such thing. I never dreamed it was a bird's nest. I have always been grateful, though this is the next to smallest PO in the state of Mississippi. And I do not enjoy being referred to as a hussy by my own grandfather. But Stella Rondo says, yes, you did say it too. Anybody in the world could have heard you that had ears. Anybody that had ears could have heard her. Stop right there, says Mama, looking at me. So I pulled my napkin straight back through the napkin ring and left the table. As soon as I was out of the room, Mama says, call her back or she'll starve to death. But Papa Daddy says, this is the beard I started growing on the coast when I was 15 years old. He would have gone on till nightfall if Shirley T. hadn't lost the Milky Way she ate in Cairo. I'm assuming that Shirley T. had a little upset tum-tum. So Papa Daddy says, I'm going to go out and lie in the hammock and you can all sit here and remember my words. I'll never cut off my beard as long as I live, even one inch, and I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it in you at all passed right by me in the hall and went straight out and got in the hammock. It, it, it would be a holiday. It was in five minutes before Uncle Rondo suddenly appeared in the hall in one of Stella Rondo's flesh-colored kimonos, all cut on the bias, like something Mr. Whitaker probably thought was gorgeous. Uncle Rondo, I says, I don't know who that was. Where are you going? Sister, he says, get out of my way. I'm poisoned. If you're poisoned, stay away from Papa Daddy, I says. Keep out of the hammock. Papa, I'm, I think poison, <laughs> I'm not sure what poisons mean. Helen Allen can tell us what poison mean. Um, if you're poisoned, stay away from Papa Daddy, I says. Keep out of the hammock. Papa Daddy will certainly beat you on the head if you come within 40 miles of him. He thinks I deliberately said he ought to cut off his beard after he got me the P.O. And I told him, I told him, and I told him. And he acts like he just didn't hear me. Papa Daddy must have gone stone deaf. He picked a fine day to do it then, says Uncle Rondo. And before you could say, Jackie, Jack Robinson flew out in the yard. Helen says he was probably drunk. That's what I think too, hon. I think he was drunk. What he'd really done, oh, he'd drunk another bottle of that prescription. <laughs> he'd drunk another bottle of that prescription. What kind of prescription? He does it every single 4th of July, sure as shooting, and it's horribly expensive. Then he falls over in the hammock and snores. So he insists on zigzagging right out to the hammock, looking like a half-wit, drunk and stumbly, it sounds like, wearing somebody's kimono. Papa Daddy woke up with this horrible yell, 
and right there, without moving an inch, he tried to turn Uncle Rondo against me. Just turned him right against her. I heard every word he said. Oh, he told Uncle Rondo I didn't learn to read until I was eight years old, and he didn't see how in the world I ever got the mail up at the P.O., much less read it at all. He said if Uncle Rondo could only fathom the links he had gone to to get me that job. And he said, on the other hand, he thought Stella Rondo had a brilliant mind and deserved credit for getting out of town. All the time, he was just laying there swinging his praise and looping out of his uh, and looping out his beard. Poor Uncle Rondo was pleading with him to slow down the hammock. It was making him dizzy to dizzy as a witch to watch it. But that's what Papa Daddy likes about the hammock. So Uncle Rondo was too dizzy to get turned against me for the time being. He's Mama's only brother, and as good and is a good case. He's Mama's only brother and is a good case of a one-track mind. Ask anybody. Certified pharmacist. He's a certified pharmacist. Just then I heard Stella Rondo ri rise in the upstairs window, raising the upstairs window. While she was married, she got this peculiar idea that it was cooler with all the windows shut and locked. So she had to raise the window before I could make... Um, so she had to raise the window before she could make a soul hear her outdoors. So she raised the window and says, Oh, you would have thought she was mortally wounded. Uncle Rondo and Papa Daddy didn't even look up, but kept right on what they were doing. I had to laugh. I flew up the stairs and threw open the door. I said, What in the wide world's the matter, Stella Rondo? You mortally wounded? No, she says, I'm not mortally wounded, but I wish you would do me a favor of do me the favor of looking out that window there and telling me what you see. So I shaded my eyes and look out the window. I see the front yard, I says. Do you see any human beings? She says. I see Uncle Rondo trying to run Pap Papa Daddy out of the hammock. I says, nothing more naturally. It's so suffocating hot in the house with all the windows shut and locked. Everybody who cares to stay in their right mind will have to go out and get in the hammock before the 4th of July is over. Did you notice anything different about Uncle Rondo? Asks Stella Rondo. Why no, except he's got on some terrible looking flesh colored contraption I wouldn't be found dead in is all I can see, I says. Never mind, you wouldn't be found dead in it because it happens to be part of my trousseau. And Mr. Whitaker took several dozen photographs of me in it, says Stella Rondo. What on earth could Uncle Rondo mean by wearing part of my trousseau out in the broad open daylight without so much as a kiss my foot, knowing I only got home this morning after my separation and hung up my negligee and hung my negligee up on the bathroom door just as nervous as I could be? I'm sure I don't know. And what do you expect me to do about it? I says, jump out the window? No, I expect nothing of the kind. I simply declare that Uncle Rondo looks like a fool in it, that's all, she says. It makes me sick to my stomach. Well, he looks as good as he can, I said. As good as anybody in reason could. I stood up for Uncle I stood up for Uncle Rondo, please remember. And I said to Stella Rondo, I think I would do well, not to criticize so freely if I were you, and came home with a two-year-old child I had never said a word about and no explanation whatsoever about my separation. I asked you the instant I entered this house not to refer one more time to my adopted child, and you gave me your word of honor you would not, was all Stella Rondo would say, and started pulling out one of her eyebrows with some cheap crest swizzers excuse me, tweezers. I don't know what a swizzer is, but there you go. So I merely slammed the door behind me and went down and, and made some green tomato pickle. Somebody had to do it. Of course, mama had turned both the staff loose. She always said no earthly power could hold anyone on the 4th of July. So she wouldn't even try it. It turned out that Japan fell 
in the lake and came within a very narrow uh, limit of drowning. So Mama trots in, lifts up the lid and says, hmm, not very good of your Uncle Rondo in his precarious condition, I must say. Or poor little adopted Shirley T. Shame on you. That made me tired, I says. That, that made me tired, I says. Well, Stella Rondo had better thank her lucky stars. It was her instead of me come trotting in in that very with that very peculiar looking child. Now, if it had been me that trotted in from Illinois and brought a peculiar looking child of two, I shudder to think of the reception I'd got, much less controlled the diet of the entire family. But you must remember, sister, that you were never married to Mr. Whitaker in the first place and didn't go up to Illinois to live, says Mama shaking a spoon in my face. If you had, I would have been just as overjoyed to see you and your little adopted girl as I was to see Stella Rondo when you wound up with your separation and came on back home. You would not, I says. Don't contradict me. I would, Mama says. But I said she couldn't convince me, though she, though she talked till she was blue in the face. Then I said, besides, you know as well as I do that that child is not adopted. She most certainly is adopted, says Mama, stiff as a poker. I says, why, Mama, Stella Rondo had her just as sure as anything in this world, and she's just too stuck up to admit it. Why, sister, said Mama, here I thought you were going to have a pleasant Fourth of July, and you start right out not believing a word your own baby sister tells you. Just as an Annie Flo went to her grave denying the facts of life, I reminded Mama. <laughs> This is really funny. I told you if you ever mention Annie Flo's name, I'd slap your face, says Mama, and slaps my face. All right, you wait and see, I says. I, says Mama, I prefer to take my child's word for anything when it's humanly possible. You, excuse me. You ought to see Mama. She weighs 200 pounds and has tiny feet. So. So she's going to insult her mom. <laughs> Look at her tiny little feet. <laughs> Just then, something perfectly horrible occurred to me. Mama, I says, can that child talk? I, I simply had to whisper. Mama, I wonder if that child could be, you know, in any way. Do you realize, I says, that she hasn't spoken one single solitary word to a human being up to this minute. This is the way she looks, I says, and I looked like this. Well, Mama and I stood there and stared at each other. It was horrible. I remember well that Joe Whitaker frequently drank like a fish, says Mama. I believe to my soul he drank chemicals. He drank chemicals. You're right. Snake oil, Helen. That's exactly what it is. And without another word, she marches to the foot of the stairs and calls Stella Rondo. Stella Rondo. Oh, Stella Rondo. What? Says Stella Rondo from upstairs. Not even the grace to get off the bed. Can that child of yours talk? Asked Mama. Stella Rondo says, can she what? Talk. Talk, says Mama. Birdie, 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 birdie. So Stella Rondo yells back. Who says she can't talk? Sister says so, Mama says. You didn't have to tell me. I know whose word of honor don't mean a thing, and says Stella Rondo. And in a minute, janky voice I ever heard in my life yells out, Oh, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. And then somebody jumps up and down in the stair hall, <laughs> in the upstairs hall at the house would have fallen down not only talks but she could tap dance calls Stella Rondo which is more than I can say some people I I won't name can do why that little precious darling thing says mama so surprised just as smart as she can be she starts talking baby talk right there then she turns to me sister you ought to be thoroughly ashamed run upstairs this instant and apologize to Stella Rondo and Shirley T 
Apologize for what? I says, I merely wondered if the child was normal, that's all. Now that she's proved she is, why, I have nothing further to say. Sister is a mess, is a mess. But Mama just turned on her heels and flew out furious. She ran right upstairs and hugged the baby. She believed it was adopted. Stella Rondos hadn't done a thing but turn her against me from upstairs while I stood there helpless over the hot stove. So that made Mama, Papa Daddy, and the baby all on Stella Rondo's side. Next, Uncle Rondo. I say that, I must say that Uncle Rondo has been marvelous to me at various times in the past, and I was completely unprepared to be made to jump out of my the way it turned out. Once Stella Rondo did something perfectly horrible to him, broke a chain letter from Flanders Field. Y'all remember chain letters that you'd get in the mail and then you, you couldn't break the chain letter. And so it's different than emails that you get these days. It, it was an actual letter and you were supposed to continue the chain letter on. And when I was in junior high, I mean, in elementary school and a little bit in junior high, I can remember that we my that me and my friends would start these chain letters and then we'd send them off. And, you know, you couldn't break the chain letter. She broke a chain letter from Flanders Field, and he took the radio back he had given her and gave it to me. Stella Rondo was furious. For six months, we all had to call her Stella instead of Stella Rondo, or she wouldn't answer. I always thought Uncle Rondo had all the brains in the entire family. Another time, he sent me to Mammoth Cave with all expenses paid. But this, this would be the day he was drinking that prescription the 4th of July. So at supper, Stella Rondo, spe Stella Rondo speaks up and says she thinks Uncle Rondo ought to try to eat a little something. So finally, Uncle Rondo said he would try a little cold biscuit with ketchup. Cold biscuits with ketchup. But that was all. So she brought it to him. So he's so drunk <laughs> that all he wants is cold biscuits and ketchup. <laughs> Do you think it is wise to sport with ketchup? I don't know what that means. Disport with ketchup in Stella Rondo's. Oh, I get it. Flesh colored kimono, I says, trying to be considerate. If Stella Rondo couldn't watch out for her trousseau, somebody had to. Any objections? Asks Uncle Rondo, just about to pour out all the ketchup. I don't mind what she says, Uncle Rondo, says Stella Rondo. Sister has been devoting this solid afternoon to sneering out my bedroom window at the way you look. <laughs> she just. <laughs> What's that, Rondo? Uncle Rondo has got the most terrible temper in the world. Anything is liable to make him tear the house down if it comes out the wrong time. So Stella Rondo says, Sister says, Uncle Rondo certainly does look like a fool in that pink kimono. Do you remember who it was that really said that? Uncle Rondo spills all the ketchup and jumps out of his chair, tears the kimono off and throws it down on the dirty floor and puts his foot on it. It had been sent all the way to Jackson. It had to be sent all the way to the Jackson, to Jackson, to the cleaners and repleted. So that's your opinion of your Uncle Rondo, is it? He says, I look like a fool, do I? Well, that's the last straw. A whole day in this house with nothing to do and then to hear you come out with a remark like that behind my back. I didn't say any such thing, Uncle Rondo, I says, and, I, and I'm not saying who did either. Why I think you all, why I think you look all right. Just try to take good care of yourself and not talk and eat at the same time, I says. I think you better go lie down. Lie down my foot, says Uncle Rondo. <laughs> I ought to have known that he was fixing to do something perfectly horrible. So he didn't do anything that night in the pre precarious state he was in. He just played casino with Mama and Stella Rondo and Shirley T and gave Shirley T a nickel with a head on both sides. It tickled her nearly to death and she called him Papa. But at 6.30 a.m. the next morning, 
he threw a whole five cent package of some unsold one inch firecrackers from the store as hard as he could into my bedroom. <laughs> and every one of them went off. Not one bad one in the string. Everybody else, anybody else, there'd be one that wouldn't go off. Well, I'm just terribly susceptible to noises of any kind. The doctor has always told me I was the most sensitive person he had ever seen in his whole life. And I was simply prostrated. <laughs> I couldn't eat. People tell me they heard it as far as the cemetery. And old Aunt Jep Patterson that had been holding her own so good thought it was judgment day and was going to meet her whole family. It's usually so quiet there. So quiet here. Huh. Sorry, I was reading this, this person's comment, which is strange. Anyway, and I'll tell you, it didn't take me any longer than a minute to make up my own, to make up my mind what to do. There I was with the whole entire house on Stella Rondo's side and turned against me. If I had anything at all, I have pride. So I, de I decided I'd go to the PO. There's plenty of room in the back, I says to myself. Well, I made no bones about letting my family catch on to what I was up to. I didn't try to conceal it. The first thing they knew, I marched in where they all were playing old maid and pulled the electric oscillating fan out. Pulled the electric oscillating fan out by the plug and everything got real hot. Next, I snatched the pillow I'd done the needle point on right off the Davenport from behind Papa Daddy. He went, ugh. I beat Stella Rondo up the stairs and finally found my charm bracelet in her bureau drawer under a picture of Nelson Eddy. So that's the way the land lies, says Uncle Rondo. There he was, piecing on the ham. Well, sister, I'll be glad to donate my army cot if you got any place to set it up. <laughs> I like Uncle Rondo. Providing you'll leave right this minute and let me get some peace. Uncle Rondo was in France. Thank you kindly for the cot and peace is hardly the word I would select if I had to resort to firecrackers at 6.30 a.m. In a young girl's bedroom, I says back to him. And as to where I intend to go, you seem to forget my position as postmistress of China Grove, Mississippi, I says. I've always got the P.O. I'll delete it, Helen, as soon as I get done with reading. Well, that made him, that made them all sit up and take notice. I went out the, I went out the front and started digging up some four clocks to plant around the PO. So she's going to also go outside and dig up some plants. <laughs> so I'm going to take my needle point and this oscillating fan and some plants, and I'm going to go live at the post office. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, says Mama, raising the windows. Those happen to be my four clocks. Everything planted in that star is mine. I've never known you to make anything grow in your life. Very well, I says, but I take, but I take the fern. Even you, Mama, can't stand there and deny I'm the one that watered that fern. And I happen to know where I can, uh, where I can send in a box top and get a packet of 1,000 mixed seeds no to the same kind, free. Y'all remember sending in box tops and getting seeds and whatnot? I remember doing that. Oh, where? Mama wants to know. But I says, too late. You tend to your house and I'll tend to mine. You hear things like that all the time if you know how the radio. Perfectly marvelous offers. Get anything you want, free. So I hope to tell you right in there and got the radio now she's gonna take the radio too and got the radio and they
I'm back. Sorry, our internet went down. It was weird. So let me see. Where was I? Let's see. Let's start uh, where she's taking the fern. Very well, I says, but I take the fern. Even you, Mama, can't stand there and deny I'm the one that watered that fern. And I happen to know where I can send in a box top and get a packet of 1,000 mixed seeds, no two the same kind, for free. Oh, where, Ma Mama wants to know. But I said, too late, you tend to your house and I'll tend to mine. You hear things like that all the time if you know how to listen to the radio. Perfectly marvelous offers. Get anything you want free. So I hope to tell you, I marched in and got that radio. And they could have all been a nail in two, especially Stella Rondo. That used to belong to, and she knew she couldn't get it back. I'd sue for sure like a shot. So she, just take, she took the radio too. So she took it all. She took the radio, the whole nine yards. I very politely took the sewing machine motor. So she took the sewing machine motor as, and I very politely took the sewing machine. Sorry, my, um, my, um, my internet went down. It was weird. And I very politely took the sewing machine mower. I helped pay them. I helped pay the most to give it to mama for Christmas back in 1929. And uh, a good big calendar. She took the calendar too. I'm taking a big calendar with the first aid remedies on it. So she's got the calendar with the first aid remedies on it, which is fantastic. And the thermometer and the Hawaiian ukulele certainly were rightfully mine. And I stood on the stepladder and got all the watermelon rind preserves and every fruit and vegetable I'd put up, every jar. She said, take it all. It's all mine. Then I began to pull the tack bluebird wall vases on the archway in the dining room. <laughs> She's going to take the tacks as well. <laughs> She's going to take it all. Who told you could have those, Miss Pris, says Mama, fanning as hard as she could. I bought them and I'll keep track of them, I says. I'll keep track of them up on one. I'll keep I'll tack them up on each side of the post office window and you can see them when you come at, to ask me for your mail. If you're so dead to see them. Not I. I'll never the darken the door of that post office again. If I live to be a hundred, mama says ungrateful. After all the money we spent on you at the normal. Me either says Stella Rondo. You can just let my mail lie up there and rot for all I can. I'll never come and relieve you of a single solitary piece. I should worry, I says. And who and who you think's going to sit down those big fat letters and postcards, by the way, Mr. Whitaker, just because he's the only man down in China Grove and you got him unfairly. Is he going to sit down and write you lengthy correspondence after you come home given no rhyme? No reason whatsoever for your separation and no explanation for the presence of that child. I may not have your brilliant mind, but I fail to see it. So mama says, sister, I've told you a thousand times that Stella Rondo simply got homesick and that child is far too big to be hers. And she says, now, why don't you just sit down and you know this? T sticks her tongue out at me in this perfect, perfectly horrible way. She has no more manners than a man on the moon. And I told her she was going to go cross-eyed someday and they'd stick. So don't, don't you cross your eyes like that. They'll stick that way. It's too late to stop me now, I says. You should have tried that yesterday. I'm going to the PO and the only way you can possibly see me is to visit me there. So Papa Daddy says, you'll never catch me setting foot in the post office, even if I should take notion in my head to write a letter to some place. He says, I won't have you reaching out of that little old window with a pair of shears and cutting my beard off, cutting any of my beard off. I'm too smart for you. We all are, says Stella Rondo. But I said, if you're so smart, where's Mr. Whitaker? So then Uncle Rondo says, I'll thank you from now on to stop reading all the orders I get on my postcards and telling everybody in China Grove what you think is the matter with them. 
But I says, I draw my own conclusions and will continue in the future to draw them. I says, if people want to write their inmost secrets on penny postcards, there's nothing in the wild, wide world you can do about it, Uncle And if you think we'll ever write another postcard, you're sadly mistaken, says Mama. Cutting off your nose to spite your face then, I said. But if you're all determined to have no more to do with the U.S. mail, think of, think of this. What will Stella Rondo do now if she wants to tell Mr. Whitaker to come after her? What's she going to do? She can't write a letter. Wah, says Stella Rondo. I knew she'd cry. She had a conniption fit right there in the kitchen. It'll be interesting to see how long she holds out, I says. And now I'm leaving. Goodbye, says Uncle Rondo. I do declare, says Mama, to think that a family of mine should quarrel on the 4th of July or the day after over Stella Rondo leaving old Mr. Whitaker and having the sweetest adopted little adopted child that it looks like we'd all be glad. Wah! says Stella Rondo and has a fresh conniption fit. He left her. You mark my words, I says. That's Mr. Whitaker. I know Mr. Whitaker. After all, I knew him first. I said from the beginning, he'd up and leave her. I foretold, ev I foretold every single thing that's happened. Where'd he go? Asks Mama. Probably to the North Pole. If he knows what's good for him, I says. But Stella Rondo just bawled and wouldn't say another word. She flew to her room and slammed the door. Now look what you've gone and done, sister. You go and apologize. I haven't got time. I'm leaving, I says. What? Well, what are you waiting around for, asks Uncle Rondo. I just picked up the kitchen clock. Now she takes the clock, too. I just picked up the kitchen clock and marched off without saying kiss my foot or anything. And never did. I remember grandmother used to say kiss my foot without saying kiss my foot or anything. And never did tell Stella Rondo goodbye. There girl going along in a wagon right in front. Girl, I says, come help me haul these. I'm going to live at the post office. Took her nine trips in her express wagon. Uncle Rondo came out on the porch and threw her a nickel. And that's the last I've laid eyes on any of my family or my family laid eyes on it for, for five solid days and nights. Stella Rondo may be telling the most horrible tales in the world about Mr. Whitaker, but I haven't heard them. As I tell everybody, I draw my own conclusions. See, I did it again. I'm trying to take a drink of my water. and There we go. Oh, but oh, I like it here. It's ideal, as I've been saying. You see, I've got everything catty-cornered the way I like it. Hear the radio. Hear the radio. All the war news. Radio, sewing machine, bookends, ironing board. That great big piano lamp. Peace, that's what I like. Butterbean vines planted all along the front where the strings are. Of course, there's not much mail. My family are naturally the main people in China Grove. <laughs> So now she doesn't got any mail to do. She doesn't have anything to do either. And if they prefer to vanish off the face of the earth for all the mail they get or the mail they write, why, I'm not going to open my mouth. Some of the folks here in town are taken up for me and some turned against me. I don't know which is which. They are, are always people who will quit buying stamps just to get on the right side of Papa Daddy. But him and here I'll stay. I want the world to know I'm happy. And if Stella Rondo should come to me this minute on bended knee and attempt to explain the incidents of her life with Mr. Whitaker, I have my fingers in both ears and refuse to listen. So there. <laughs> well, that's a fantastic story. I hope that y'all enjoyed that. I mean, to tell you what, I'm not even sure what to think about Sister and Stella Rondo. It sounds like uh, it sounds like sisters making up a bunch of stories to me, but you know, <laughs> I mean to tell you, it's pretty funny. So I hope you all enjoyed the reading for today. You join us next week. We're gonna do a reading next. Well, let me let me look at my calendar because I'd forgotten. Let's see, what are we doing? Are we doing a reading next week?
Uh, let's see. I, I, I can't figure out what I'm doing. Yeah, we're doing a reading next week. <laughs> Took me a minute to figure out my calendar. So I will get the, um, the essay questions uh, typed up um, and uh, put up for y'all, for y'all to look at. And then don't forget, we've got our, we've got, because we've got our books are going to give away. And then uh, don't forget to um, follow us on the Facebook and the Instagrams and the Twitters and like our YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And, and we'll keep reading up until um, we get to uh, Dr. Helen's next, um, next show. And that's going to be a lot of fun. And then um, make sure that you are sending us your correspondence because we love your correspondence. Again, here's a lovely photo of uh, here's, um, Nicole's lovely painting, watercolor painting. And I just love that. And it makes me very happy. So uh, until uh, next Saturday, uh, we'll see you later. And thanks for joining us.